Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, this, our 34th episode of This is CDR. Uh, my name is Toby Bryce. I work on carbon removal policy advocacy with Open Air based in Brooklyn, New York. If you haven't already, please introduce yourself in the chat and tell us where you're um, zooming in from. This is CDR uh, is an online event series presented by Open Air to explore the wide range of carbon removal solutions currently being researched, developed, and deployed, and to contextualize them for policy proposals uh, Open Air is developing and advancing in New York and other uh, states and jurisdictions. Just a quick background on Open Air. Um, we are a distributed global volunteer network dedicated to the advancement of carbon removal solutions essential to solving the climate crisis. Uh, we're a global community growing quickly, and we'd love to have you join us. We work together on shared open source uh, missions in the areas of policy advocacy, research and development, and CDR market development. Um, please, uh, again, join us. There should be a link in the chat. Quick background on carbon removal. Many of you will be familiar, but it's really important to set the terms of what we're talking about up front. Um, this is the IPCC definition, which is also the definition from the CDR primer. Um, carbon removal are anthropogenic activities to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and durably store it in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoirs or in long-lived products. Um, when we talk about CDRs, we are today, and with the series, it's really essential to emphasize that carbon removal is not in any way an alternative to reducing emissions. Um, we must reduce global emissions and decarbonize our economy as quickly and as completely as possible, full stop. That said, <clears throat> the science is clear. There's clear scientific consensus, including in very stark terms in the recent IPCC AR6 Working Group 3 report that carbon removal will be required at gigaton scale, that's billions of tons per year, by mid-century to counteract those emissions that are difficult or inequitable to abate in a climate relevant timeframe. And ultimately in the second half of the century to start removing the tremendous excess of anthropogenic CO2 already in the atmosphere. Um, so we can restore our climate to a safer and healthier state. As we've seen, you know, we're approaching 1.5 C temperature rise and our climate is not in a healthy state. So carbon removal is not gonna be an option. It's gonna be a requirement. Um, the current scale of carbon removal is effectively zero, thousands of tons per year. So we really need to start working now to scale durable carbon removal so we can get to where we need to be um, by mid-century. To that end, um, one of the policies Open Air is working on, we just wanna to highlight today, it's called the Carbon Dioxide Removal Leadership Act. It's a state level carbon removal procurement policy framework. Um, it's a live bill in New York, um, A8597, S8171. Um, to provide market support to scale durable carbon removal. Um, it's standards based, so we're not picking what carbon removal pathway the state would procure. Um, it's, we set standards and then otherwise it's pathway agnostic. The bill is really focused on equity, community benefit and environmental justice, which is obviously critical when we're talking about scaling new technology, in this case, carbon removal. Um, it's also really important industrial development policy for a state like New York, um, so that the state can be positioned to take advantage of what will be a you know, trillion dollar economic sector in the coming decades. Um, additionally, it's a state policy that we're working to advance in six to eight other states in the U.S. So again, this is something that we'd love to have help with. And so please uh, check it out and uh, sign up to join us uh, via the link in the chat. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Mega Raghavan, who is going to tell you a little bit more about the run of show and introduce today's session. Hey everyone, I'm Mega. I am an open air member working on advocacy efforts uh, based in London, but also working on a bunch of things out in California and the US where I'm from. Uh, so quick housekeeping notes as usual, we're gonna start off with a 15 to 20 minute presentation followed by a few prepared questions and then we'll have moderated audience Q&A. So if you have any questions uh, throughout, please type them into the Q&A box in Zoom. Um, it's separate from the chat box, so please find the one called Q&A just to help us manage the question list better. Um, the event is being recorded, so we'll send the video link out to everyone who registered, and we'll also post it on YouTube, on uh, Open Air's website and to our YouTube channel. Um, and we'll also be live tweeting today's event, so we'll put the Twitter link in the chat if that's not there already. Uh, please just follow along if you tweet, um, and the hashtag is this is CDR for the event. Um, and this week on This is CDR, we're very happy to welcome Mission Zero CEO, Dr. Nicholas Chadwick, to tell us about the company's modular electrochemical and low-cost stack process and plans for deployment and scale. Mission Zero's technology can deploy rapidly using existing supply chains that exist globally today, while consuming three to five times less energy than other approaches. Dr. Chadwick will speak about the company's unique R&D process, which focuses on constraint-based and outcome-driven research, leading to expedited timeframes to market for hardware, where traditionally DAC technologies have studied the uh, struggle to demonstrate or overcome scaling problems. Nicholas Chadwick is the CEO and co-founder of Mission Zero Technologies, a chemist and material scientist by training with a PhD 
from University College London. He's worked for many years in industries such as semiconductors, renewable energy, and water security, where material science could play a pivotal role in innovation and new capabilities. Nicholas began managing a carbon capture project, and he became hooked and convinced that DAC was the one thing we needed and didn't have yet. Through the venture builder Deep Science Ventures, he founded Mission Zero in July 2020 with his co-founders Gail and Shil. The company raised investment from DSV, Anglo-American, and other top-tier climate tech investors and has been pioneering, pioneering a new form of DAC ever since. So, Nicholas, over to you. Thanks, Maya. Hello, everyone. Um, I might as well get my slides up and, and take you through, but I'm thrilled to be here. I'm really looking forward to telling you more about what we're doing at Mission Zero. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Nicholas Chadwick. Um, I won't reintroduce myself again because, uh, you know, that was what Mega did a, a pretty good job right there. But um, I want to start by telling you all a joke, and it's not a great joke, um, but, you know, we'll see how it goes. So there's, there's two muffins in an oven, right? And one muffin says to the other, oh, my Lord, we're in an oven and we're slowly being baked to death. And the other muffin goes, oh, my God, a talking muffin. Right, so I, I can't actually tell if anyone's laughing at that, so we'll, we'll just move on. But on a serious note, we're the first muffin. Our CO2 emissions are slowly baking us all to death. And that's terrible. That's, you know, we're seeing this with the heat waves in India. You know, these are going to become more prevalent as, as climate change becomes worse and worse over time. You know, we always kind of think of, I guess maybe conceptually, we think about we have like till 2050 to stop worrying about it, but it's happening right now. These are problems on the ground and they're only going to become worse. And so, you know, there's always this kind of like doom and gloom perspective on climate change. But Mission Zero wants to take this kind of perspective, actually, that we could view the CO2 that's in our atmosphere as a huge carbon resource. And fundamentally, we could repurpose it to be the carbon backbone of a future economy. And fundamentally, um, there are billions and billions of tons to plunder, pillage, use as we wish over the next 20, 30, 100 years, and only derive environmental benefit from doing so. And I think the CO2 in our atmosphere is actually the only resource I can think of that displays this inverse relationship with environmental benefit. So the more we use, the better things get. If you can think of another resource ex that, that exhibits that kind of behavior, let me know, tweet me. I'd love to hear from you because I can't seem to think of any others. And... Contra contrary to this idea that we want to get rid of CO2, um, demand for CO2 as a commodity is rocketing, right? Um, you know, we need to utilize them in carbon negative building materials. We can all agree that carbon uh, removal credits will be worth something like a trillion dollars by 2050. I was getting nervous throwing out numbers like that, but we can agree it's going to be really large. But fundamentally, the issue uh, around solving this whole decarbonization problem from the atmosphere and connecting it and monetizing it is building a direct air capture technology that allows you to solve this decarbonization problem and fundamentally provide a supply chain of CO2 to feed into different facets of carbon removal, be it uh, pure sequestration and storage, or be it something like a utilization play within, say, building materials. Now, um, what I want to do before I take you into the DAC technology we built and, and what, where we're going with essentially the projects that we're looking to build out, I want to give you a kind of roadmap of how we actually went about, went about building it, because we have a fairly unique approach at Mission Zero to building technologies. Um, and this is essentially adopted from the venture builder that we spun out of Deep Science Ventures. Now, I want to step back a little bit from DAC and maybe just tell you a little story about lithium-ion batteries, right? Lithium-ion batteries, and we can use solar photovoltaics or LCD screens is a great example. These took multiple decades to commercialize properly. They were invented in the lab, or the concept or phenomenon behind them were proved in the lab. It took time to enter, you know, the mass uh, I guess, uh, adoption within uh, academic circles, being published on, investigated properly, spun out the infrastructure built, all these kinds of things. So, you know, now lithium-ion batteries and everything, you, uh, you know, you, I have uh, AirPods and, you know, an iPhone and my Hoover has lithium-ion batteries in it as well, right? They're, they're mass, they're everywhere, we use them in everything. But it took so long for that scale experience curve work to happen that you know, we don't really get to make that play with, with climate change. We only have 10 years to get to 2030. It's actually eight years, right? To get to the point where we have a foot in the door and we're actively fighting climate change and we're removing CO2 from our atmosphere at some kind of appreciable scale. Eight years versus 60 just isn't going to cut it. And so for us, acknowledging that kind of time problem and the inherent problem with scaling technologies from things like university labs is that what we do is we don't focus on blue skies research without focus. And this is a kind of like university research model that I'm talking about here, where there's a kind of aimless, non-specific targeted approach that doesn't take into account mar market forces. And what it fundamentally solves is one specific problem in a supply chain of problems that need to be brought together for an engineering solution. 
what we actually look to do is utilize experience and mistakes from others and scaled industries where someone's already done this cost and experience worth, uh, curve work for us. And we tie them together wherever we can with targeted innovations. So we don't have to build everything from scratch. We don't have to build our manufacturing capability from scratch. Actually, all we can do, what we can do is tap into existing supply chains and we make targeted innovations that allow us to tie them all together. And what I'm going to do is use our DAC technology as a great example to prove that. So DAC's actually really simple. There's only two processes to direct air capture, right? You capture CO2 in a medium, and then you regenerate the CO2 from that medium, right? And people have come up with a variety of ways, essentially, of um, figuring out how you can capture CO2. And what they all exhibit is the requirement, essentially, for um, a variety of... Um, energy inputs, different resources to regenerate the CO2. And if you look at the energy consumption of these two processes, um, what you have for capturing CO2 is a variety of technologies, things like solid-based amines, hydroxide carbonates, MOFs, zeolites, alkali, methyl oxides. Um, but fundamentally, all these processes are basically the same. And you know, they actually are quite energy efficient. I think most people like to make a play on, you know, we can get around this kind of like need for um, active uh, air contacting or fans, all these kinds of things. But actually, that's, that's quite a low energy solution for capturing CO2. The majority of your cost, engineering complexity and energy consumption comes from regenerating the CO2. And so if you need to integrate things like waste heat, you need concentrated solar, steam, um, other forms of high-grade heat or use, to, to use natural gas, what it invariably does is bake in emissions that you don't control into your life cycle analysis. And it also consumes thousands of kilowatt hours per ton. I can't remember exactly how you convert that to gigajoules, but it's a lot, you know. And so actually, whilst most people, most people are making uh, this kind of... Uh, play for innovating and changing your capture material because it might give you small incremental gains and in, say the energy required to regenerate your material you know so you take it from like 100 degrees celsius down to 90. no one's actually taking this kind of holistic focus on technology design here and they're not looking to actually make the biggest innovation gains possible which is how you regenerate the co2 because if you remove that make it more simple you lower the energy consumption you reduce your price and make it a lot easier to adopt so the question we asked ourselves at Mission Zero when we were at a venture builder called Deep Science Ventures, and I think Megan uh, alluded to this earlier, is that um, you know, we took this constraint and market-focused approach to technology development. And what that means is we wanted to establish early on what a holy grail solution looks like for direct air capture. Like we have to identify what that looks like first. With this perspective and lens that somebody has to pay for CDR, I think everyone on this call would agree fundamentally that there's a moral imperative to doing what we're doing in removing CO2 from the atmosphere, but we have to be able to harness markets to be able to make it happen. There'll be an interplay between governments and a, and a variety of different factors that, that move that along, but fundamentally someone has to pay for it. So the question we asked ourselves was, well, how do you do that? And if you go down that top-down approach rather than thinking bottom-up about technology and hoping it will fit into every niche that you might need to come across, can we actually solve a question that has plagued direct air capture for a long time? And so we asked ourselves, well, what's the market like? And we looked at it and we thought, well, the VCM is nascent. You know, a vulture carbon credit market is pretty nascent at the moment. It's potentially enormous, like it could be a trillion dollar industry. But is it something we can fundamentally rely on at this moment in time? It's hard to make that play because it's only tens of millions in size at this moment in time in terms of trading volume. However, there is a, con a large commodity market for CO2 and it's a multi-billion dollar industry. It's used for food and beverage, synthetic building aggregates. And what's more interesting about this space is that um, the, we have a load of technologies, materials, processes for utilizing CO2 or converting into things like plastics, chemicals, fuel, building materials, etc., high value carbons, um, semiconductors. There's a whole range of things we can do with CO2 because fundamentally it's a carbon source. But, but at the moment, there is no supply chain to enable that. And so the question for us was we have a billion dollar market. Can we grow it to be a hundred billion dollar market um, through decentralized direct air capture? You go, okay, cool. So who are our customers early on? What problems do they have? What do we need to solve? How can we establish what this whole holy grail solution looks like? And what product market fit do we need to have for that to make sense? And so these are questions for customers like, what do your supply look like? You know, do you have interruptions in service? What's the price sensitivity like? Um, do you like your suppliers at the moment? Are there problems with them that you would like to avoid? And through doing that, you know, I think before we even founded the company, we'd spoken to about 100 different companies in the CO2 supply chain for CO2 to value. 
And what this allowed us to do was identify these operational constraints that we needed to work within, that the DAC technology we would go on to build needs to work within. And fundamentally, the key things that got highlighted to us was, well, actually, if you could provide the CO2 on site, that would be great because then we're not reliant on uh, problems in traffic, baked in emissions, people not turning up on site. It gives us flexibility. One of the main constraints that got identified also was that, you know, we can only rely on electricity. And actually, uh, fundamentally, you can't rely always on a waste heat integration source um, at any kind of industrial site. You want to put this on a building site. You want to integrate it with renewable energy projects and megaton projects. You know, at both ends of the scale, electricity is king. And it needs to be scale independent. And what I mean by this is it needs to make economic sense, both a, a thousand tons a year of capability all the way up to gigatons. So now that we have our constraints, we then went and built our tech from there. So we identified these technology constraints that were informed by these market needs. And these were things like, uh, you know, users needing things like continuous uninterrupted supply, a green carbon negative source so they can access CDR credits, price and sensitivity, and they need to be insulated from external market forces. And what I mean by this is, you know, if you look at the way the CO2 is currently sourced, it's a waste byproduct from a fossil fuel industry, uh, the way that we produce ammonia. And so actually every time you open a can of coke, what you're really doing is emitting a delayed emission uh, from the production of hydrogen that goes into fertilizers. If we can produce a green source of CO2 to feed these industries, we can start to take this away and start to actually change the industries for the better. So now that we have these constraints, we set up ourselves a question of like, great, you have all those uh, things you need to work within, you've constrained yourself down, how do you make it work? And we took inspiration from biology. So nature did the hard work for us in a way. Nature actually has found a way of processing CO2 really efficiently for billions of years. Now it's gonna be a little bit corny, but if you take a deep breath in and then you breathe out, you'll feel a little bit calmer. But also what has happened is in your body, your CO2 has produced CO2, you've respired, and your body stores the CO2 in your blood as carbonic acid. And actually what it does is store it as bicarbonate ions and protons if you push the equilibrium more the way to the right. It does this using a catalyst called carbonic anhydrase. Disclaimer, we don't use carbonic anhydrase. But what this allows your body to do is store the CO2 in water and it allows you to transport it to your lungs, kind of a boundary between your lungs and the atmosphere. The enzyme interconverts the CO2, your bicarbonate protons back into CO2 and water. So this unique chemistry of CO2 in water is hydration chemistry is the reason you can breathe. It's why beer is fizzy and it's why bread rises. Um, it's fundamentally a very low energy pathway for processing CO2. Um, in fact, the enzyme that used to process the CO2 in your body is so efficient, it's evolved three times separately within biology. It's fundamental to the way that biology works. So for us, that was a, a great stage in the post to think, well, actually, can we take this chemistry and can we house it with off the house it with in-shelf, off-the-shelf components? So when we say off-the-shelf components, this goes back to our technology focus of wanting to uh, utilize others' scale and experience work from different industries and use targeted innovations to tie them together. And so what we've done is built a continuous compact direct air capture process. In the first step, we take a solvent we've developed, which is the majority water with a carbon capture additive, um, and we capture 75% of the CO2 that uh, comes from the atmosphere. We use this doing off-the-shelf componentry, such as drift eliminators, fans, packing materials. It's in a way very similar to the way that carbon engineering does, but the chemistry is incredibly different. And then we take the CO2 that's uh, stored in the solvent and we pass it through an electrochemical separation technology that's used every day to provide clean, walking, clean drinking water to millions of people around the world. So, um, you know, this is another off-the-shelf technology. As far as we know, it handles something like 5% uh, of Spain's clean water every year. And people have already done the design, operation, and, you know, long-term testing of this technology to the point where um, if you were to replace some of the largest plants in the world with, um, instead of processing dirty water, they were to be uh, processing the solvent that we use in our process, um, actually you'd have a megaton of CO2 regeneration capacity already in one plant. So we don't have to invoke a large amount of imagination to know what this looks like at scale. Somebody who's already designed it, built it, operated it for decades, and it's been project financed as well. What's more, there's multiple supply chains all around for this tech, all around the world for this technology as well. So we can actually implement the technology in a very agile way compared to 
others who may be doing a vertical, a vertical integration process in their own company, which is kind of like building another company within the company. We get to forestall that a little bit by using these off-the-shelf technologies. And what we've shown is this integrated process, we think um, we'll be able to consume less than 500 kilowatt hours per ton of CO2 as a total end-to-end -end DAC process. It operates at room temperature, it uses only electricity, and the CO2 that comes out is a 98% more purity. The other 2% is something like humidity. It's just humidity. Um, if we use renewables in this, the net negativity is 98%, which is great for this, uh, which is great if you want to be providing green CO2 or making sure the carbon credits you produce are at the highest value. And like I said, we use scaled off the shelf components. In our technology development journey, we've just been able to ring vendors up and ask them, can I have a system of this size? And they go, yep, that's fine. I'll be with you in 10 weeks. What I want to do now is take you through some of the projects that we're working on at Mission Zero as a part of our scaling up uh, activities. And so um, the first project we're working on is a pilot project. Um, the first stage has been funded by the British government. And this is for 100 tons per year of CO2 uh, capture regeneration capacity. Um, this is the project that's been uh, Striper supported. And we're working with a company called OCO Technology who makes synthetic building aggregates in the UK from waste fly ashes from incinerators. Uh, we've had the feed uh, process of this technology or rather this project funded by the British government and we're waiting potentially for phase two follow-on funding to build a pilot with planned operations in 2023. Having said that we've already fundraised um, and we've begun detailed design anyway so um, this is fundamentally something we intend to take forward it's key to our technology development and it's something we're really excited about but I think probably what everyone is mostly interested in um, is the big announcement that came out um, a couple of weeks ago about Project Hajar. And Hajar, or rather Al-Hajar um, in Arabic means the stone. And we thought this was a really a really um, fitting name for the, the project that we're undertaking with our project partners, 4401. So uh, without much ado, I'm going to dive into this in a bit more detail. So Project Ajar has been awarded one of 15 milestone $1 million awards by the Elon Musk CDRX Prize. Um, and in partnership with 4401, we'll be removing 1,000 tonnes of CO2 per year minimum, permanently and storing it uh, in peridotite formations in the Al Hajar mountain range in Oman. We'll be delivering this by 2024. And what we're really excited about this is in collaboration with 4401 is we're able to get access to really clean renewable electricity. And so what this allows us to do is deliver the technology in its best format without um, knowing there are going to be baked in emissions from using grid electricity. And what I've done here is given, you know, a nice little Mission Zero uh, 4401. You can see where the uh, project logo comes in, but I also reproduced it in meme format. Um, that was just a joke I came up with at the last minute. So um, whether you like it or not, there you go. Um, but you can see here some of the mock-ups that we have for the technology. We think a 1,000 tons of capability could easily fit within a, a very small format of a couple of shipping containers. And is our hope that the energy generation, storage, and injection capabilities will all be on the same site when we work together with 4401. We've already begun the feed study work for this. Um, and so, yeah, I hope that we'll be able to update you in due course about the progress of, of Project Tajar. So a little bit about uh, myself and the team. You've obviously heard um, a little bit about me, but there are two other people who are instrumental in this story. So actually, the story starts with our CTO, Gal. He spent about nine months at DSV scoping out the technology, looking at solutions before we decided to bring myself and Shillo. Um, Gal has uh, many, many years uh, background in CO2 electric chemistry, having worked at academic and uh, private institutions and has raised money in crypto backed software companies. Um, and Shill actually had just finished his PhD in carbon capture and energy storage from Imperial, has a lot of experience in techno economic modeling, and have worked at BP Ventures previously as well. Currently advised by Phil DeLuna, who is a previous COSIA X Prize finalist. He's an ex director of the National Research Council of Canada, carbon tech entrepreneur. He actually ran for the Green Party candidacy of Toronto, and he's now working at McKinsey. Um, and I'm just going to show you some photos of our um, new engineering facility. It's an empty room in this photo, but it's now filled with things. Uh, we have a team of about 11 people, and our hope is that we'll be about a team of 22 people in a couple of months' time. And actually spent many, many years before 
um, joining DSV and installing Mission Zero in basically, basically early stage tech development. Uh, the focus for me, for me was impact. So what I wanted to do was just be making sure I was moving the needle forward in some way, shape or form. I worked in semiconductors, in renewable energy, in water sensors, and actually spent a lot of time in water security because for me, water was the one thing that well, it fundamentally got left behind in climate change debate. No one really cares about water, but you know, it's fundamentally the most used resource on the planet. And you know, you can go a whole month without eating, but you can't go five days without drinking water. So it's fundamental to our needs. But what you see is people's just rights and access to water being sort of roughshod over by the climate uh, by climate change. But you're on the back foot. You're always solving the problem as it, after it's happened, essentially. And at the same time as doing this, I think this is referenced in the introduction, I was managing a carbon capture project as part of my work with Imperial College. It was really low-key, kind of um, low TRL, early stage research. But for me, I just became, I just thought, like, this is something really important. And actually, you can be on the front foot. You can be fighting it instead of being punched in the face almost. And so for me, I just thought, I didn't necessarily think I was going to start a company. What I thought was I wanted to contribute some grit, sweat and tears into the mix and see if as a material scientist with someone in a specific expertise base, I could move the needle forward. And it's only really through coming uh, across Guile, our CTO, that I, couldn't, I was convinced that I should start a company that's going to be delivering the maximum impact. And, you know, I guess maybe in the audience might have this experience, but when you kind of just meet somebody and within 10 minutes, you're like, this person's onto something and I want in. I don't know exactly what it is, but if they're willing to have me, I'll come along and see what happens. And fortunately, Gal did. Matt Schill as well. And we spent about four months at DSV scoping out Mission Zero, doing all this customer discovery work, not necessarily worrying about technology development at an early stage. It was about proving actually that someone would pay for it. Having done that, spun the company out in July 2020, raised a pre-seed round with Anglo-American, one of our major investors at that time in September 2020. And we've also just closed another funding round um, in February, which there'll be an announcement about it in the next couple of days, potentially. So who knows? Um, but yes, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, for me, it's always just been about impact. And, and that's fundamentally how I got into this. I didn't necessarily think I was going to start a company or I was going to make loads of money or anything like this. For me, it was just... The environment's Recording really important. Progress. To, do something to, to protect it. Got it. That's great. Um, thank you for all that. Um, switching gears a little bit. Um, one thing we talk about a lot at Open Air with DAC, um, Peter Miner at Carbon 180 wrote a great article. It was a while ago at this point, several months, called DAC 2.0. And he kind mm -hmm. of identified, it was a little mm -hmm. bit about heirloom, I think, if we're being honest. But, um, but uh, he identified a couple of key attributes to kind of take DAC to the next level, which most mm -hmm. of which you referenced when you were going through your slides, but I think they're worth kind of getting a little more emphasis to. Yeah, of course. His, his three items were number one, passive air contact, which I think is shorthand for increasing energy efficiency, which you definitely talked about. Um, number two is modular, um, both the form factor and then also thinking about parts and using existing supply chains. And then number three, moving beyond chemical sorbents, like thinking about what the sorbent is, it's, you know, techno-economics and its sustainability. Um, can you just kind of, again, it's a little bit of a recap, but I think it's helpful. Could you just walk through those ideas with respect to Mission Zero and how you do or do not illustrate those concepts? Yeah, of course. So, I mean, the, you know, our, our system isn't a um, passive air contacting concept. It is an active concept. But, you know, from our perspective, when you look at the techno-economics of uh, a similar air contacting process that Carbon Engineering has done, well, fortunately, they've done a lot of work for us and they have published this in peer-reviewed journals and they've continued to update it. And so, you know, in our techno-economics, when we make these cost projections of how we're going to get to sub $100 a ton by a specific time frame at a specific scale, actually, we have a lot of confidence in those numbers because we bake a lot of conservative, um, a lot of conservative, it, we make those numbers conservative, essentially. So I think passive contacting is interesting. I think there are logistical and kind of engineering challenges, but I don't think they're insurmountable necessarily. And early and clearly, I don't think that's the case either as well. Um, but fundamentally, yeah, you know, if you can bring your energy consumption down, then you do start to remove a large part of your OPEX. And also part of your energy efficiency is about reducing CapEx costs as well, because it's just the reduction of, of CapEx in that instance. So these are both levers that we're looking to pull at Mission Zero. And I haven't been able to demonstrate uh, a lot of work towards that already. We've already found that the, you know, we're able to reduce um, our energy consumption, you know, lower than we thought it might be. Um, we've already found capex elements will be cheaper than we thought they would be all these kinds of things so um and this you know then goes on to speak about um using existing supply chains 
at scale when you're building megatons and gigatons and using, say, a water purification technology, there probably is a vertical integration question that you need to answer because people need clean drinking water and you don't want to be necessarily stealing uh, supply from a um, a necessary use case, right? That, that is one thing that needs to be thought about. But early on, it's our judgment that actually for uh, the first couple of implementations and even at large scale megatons that this isn't something that's going to be problematic. These are off-the-shelf technologies that have been used all around the world for decades. And for us, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a shoe in. Why wouldn't you? And then the second point was about, um, I think I answered one and three, but not two. Oh, sorbent. Oh, oh, yeah, beyond chemical sorbents. Yeah, I mean, for us in, in our technology, we're actually kind of sorbent agnostic. So for us, like, the sorbent actually isn't that interesting. It's the chemistry that it enables. And so, you know, it's all about actually does it enable this really low energy consumption process for the regeneration of the CO2? Does it enable to be electric only? Does it happen at room temperature? And that's really the only metric for us. So actually, I think there's a lot of candidates within the sorbent space that we could use, but actually that's not really what it's about. And I think when you take that kind of chemistry or kind of sorbent specific approach, what you're doing is tying yourself early on to a kind of technology development pathway that doesn't give you the flexibility to move or pivot when you need to. And because they're fundamentally spun out from university research labs or, or a lot of them are essentially, is that you haven't answered these larger questions about this kind of, you know, what does the market need? What are the constraints? It's a very bottom-up approach to technology development. And it's, you know, where these phrases, things like valleys of death come from, because there are a thousand variables you can never account for. And actually, those are the things you need to worry about earlier on. And if you can get a headline view of what they might look like by doing a lot of legwork, by customer delivery, uh, customer discovery work, by utilizing off-the-shelf technologies and unpublished research previously, you'll serve yourself a lot of headaches further down the line. Um, that's great. It's a really, I think, pretty unique perspective. And so far, you know, it's hearing from DAC companies. And obviously, you're doing some things right, I believe. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the price point in your Stripe app, which I put in the chat, was $275 a ton? Uh, it's in total $320. I think it's about $300. Um, yeah, so it's about $280. Yeah. It's you know, it about $40 the, for storage. The lowest, I think, published price point for DAC out there. And this was a year ago. So um, that's fantastic. And congratulations. Um, drilling down a little bit into modularity, um, can you talk about what a what is your form factor for your module, if there is such a concept yeah, sure. of the way your technology works, um, number one, and, and both in terms of the physical size, um, just of the capture piece, and then the tons per year that would capture? Yeah. So I mean, what we're envisaging for our pilot plan, and this is by no means an optimized system because, you know, people need to walk around and be able to take samples and, and this kind of thing. It's not a design product. It's a, an integration of processes to show that it works at a particular scale. We think this will come in about two shipping containers with two stories with the air contactor on top. Okay. Um, when you're talking about something like, say, you know, a thousand tons a year, we're thinking maybe this is more like a, a couple of shipping containers with... Um, you know, when we when we have the renderings from Hajar, for example, which I think were you know disclosed in the the um, in the press release that we made, you know, this is a thousand ton per year system. So you're talking hundreds, uh, high hundreds, if not thousands, of tons of capability within the footprint of, of what we put there is about four shipping containers. But it's worth saying that the detailed design of that work is being done, and you know, we don't know exactly what it's going to look like at this moment in time. It's by no mind by no means a kind of um, design module system. But from a modularity perspective, uh, what we can say is, you know, the electrochemical regeneration process that we talk about, um, it's not the case, like, if one goes down, for example, you have to shut the whole plant down because they're just plumbed in, in parallel. And so if one goes down, you can easily isolate it. You know, you have this modularity in, in process. And if you have just got this four factor, it's really easy just to build them next to each other. So rather than this kind of, the words, it's kind of harsh, but stolid view of like building chemical plants, we're not really interested in that. What we're interested in is kind of decentralized drag and drop capability where you go, I need a thousand tons of capability here. It's one unit. You turn up, you drop it on the ground and you plug it in and it starts generating CO2. That's the design focus that we're taking here. And then so are, is it, are you, am, I, am I understanding correctly that you're not necessarily thinking about a megaton scale plant a unitary megaton scale plant, but rather a more decentralized distributed distribution? So what I'd say is, you know, we are going to have to build megaton plants in the future, but the exact way that that's done, um, you know, 
the size of the commodity market at the moment for CO2 is, is kind of small. Like it's, it's about 240 megatons and about 100 megatons of that isn't priced in. Essentially, it's, you know, it's not removal you can really access. And so um, there will be the need to build these megaton plants. But what we're actually evaluating at the moment is what, what is the best pathway to do that? Is it, you know, that we own the resource and plant and do it ourselves? Or do we find partners to help us deliver that? So in the end, you know, what we do want to realize is this gigaton or potentially megaton decentralized supply chain of CO2. But if your technology works at that scale length, there's no reason that it won't do, do incredibly well when you get to just these large kind of, um, not immobile, but kind of not moving around implementations for, say, a megaton of capability. Because it works at a thousand tons, it will work in a megaton really well. Um, one last question from open air and then when a lot of great audience questions coming in and please keep those coming and we want to get to those. Um, uh, so, so you're the, the future form factor and scale is a little bit uncertain maybe based on where you are now, but can you talk about, you know, as you, as you scale, um, and maybe these demonstration plants, it's less of an issue, but can you talk about how you as a company and, and you as, uh, as the CEO think about the, the need to engage with local communities that are in and around your plants? Uh, maybe they, you know, it's less of an issue in the desert, but it sounds like some of your um, deployment would have this issue. Um, what, is, what will it be like for someone to live near a, a Mission Zero um, uh, deployment? And will it be loud? Um, are there other potential externalities? Like, can you talk a little bit about that and then how you think about engaging with local communities to, to you know, hear what they think and and like how would you look at that process and think about that yeah of course i think there's kind of two views that you can take here and it's like <clears throat> either in a regulated space or a highly like unregulated space right and so from a regulated space perspective well even from an unregulated space perspective we want to take a design approach that minimizes all these factors anyway like we want it to be quiet. We want to make sure that we're committing the least amount of damage to the environment, that we're baking in the smallest amount of emissions as possible. So we set the standards high for ourselves so that others don't have to do it for us because we want to design, you know, as we said before, this kind of holy grail solution for DAC. And what that means is, you know, you need to be thinking about what it's like to live around this kind of plan, what it's like to interact with it, what it's going to be doing to its local environment if it does have any kind of effects. And we have actually had to answer these questions because we have... Um, done a feed study that was funded by the British government. And part of that was to investigate essentially what the uh, permitting requirements and kind of uh, planning needs would be around a project that is even just a hundred tons a year of capability or a hundred plus essentially. And so actually we've had to answer many of these questions. And so it's things like, you know, we have to know exactly how loud the fans are going to be. And what we're able to do at least is go to vendors and say, because we're using off the shelf components again, they're able to tell us exactly what the noise level is going to be of these th these pieces of machinery. And so actually, you know, considerations for daytime versus nighttime operation, how we might integrate with changes in uh, electricity prices. Um, but I think when you get to these kind of like large megaton, uh, megaton implementations, you're going to have to be engaging with local communities because it's their atmosphere as well. It's their environment. We've built the technology to protect their environment, right? That's, that's why we're doing this. Like they're, in our view, almost like an equal stakeholder in this. And so we'd always want to make it as positive for them as possible. So, you know, we're not going to be running roughshod over people's um, people's thoughts on citing a DAC plant somewhere. That's why we try wherever we can, I guess, to implement it in places where there are uh, either highly regulated spaces and it's well understood, or we can mitigate the effects by, say, working in the desert, say, in Oman, Al-Hajar, this kind of thing. So, um, Community engagement is going to be really important for us uh, and DAC as a community and, and, and industry generally. Um, but it's going to be interesting, I think, to see where the majority of implementations happen and where those regulations are in place. But all I can say for Mission Zero is we'll always look to set the standards high straight from the beginning so that you know we deliver the best product for you know the best environmental benefit for the people in the local area, but also around the world. It's great to hear. Um, thank you so much. Uh, hey, Mega, do you want to hop on now and take some of the, uh, post some of these audience questions? Uh, hey, yeah, definitely. Um, so we got a couple of questions on water requirements. So, you know, relative to tons of CO2 um, or ever, however you think about it, um, what's kind of the water requirement for the process that you guys have? Sure. So um, what I'm not going to do is throw out a number exactly about how much water we use per ton of CO2. 
purely because actually we have a projection, but we don't exactly know if it's correct at the scale that we're talking about. So um, we're not adverse to publishing those numbers necessarily when when we have a really good view of what they're going to be. But you know what we are able to do is use similar numbers to what's been projected in carbon engineering's peer-reviewed published literature. And so we project those uh, numbers into our techno-economics. And we've already thought about, you know, what this what this would look like. Um, so there will be some water replenishments required because you won't have 100% necessarily uh, retainment of the uh, solvent from drift elimination. But, you know, we know that the levels of the carbon capture additive in the solution are well below um, any kind of, you know, regulation or, or kind of um, emission requirements, uh, even in the UK or across Europe, which are kind of like the most stringent um, emission environments you might have. And our hope is actually that because air contacting is actually, you know, as a total energy consumption DAC, a very, what's the word, um, energy efficient process relative to the main drawer of energy, which is the regeneration. It won't be that difficult to make innovations in how we retain water. So our hope is that we can move as close and close as possible to unity as, as a closed system. But at the moment, it's hard to give you a full figure because we're kind of still figuring out exactly what that looks like when we get to a, a specific scale of implementation. But, you know, to say that, you know, if, if um, the person who's asked this question is kind of problematic about me not giving a specific answer, I'm not adverse to telling uh, the world what those, those numbers look like because we want to be able to engage with the community properly. But... Give me a few months, yeah. give me some time, and we'll, we'll get back to you on that one. I mean, I think it's even useful just knowing, like, sort of the ambition of being as close to a uh, closed system as possible is where you're headed. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah. And I think we had a couple of other questions about the process itself. So the next one would be just, um, you know, you talked a bit about the unit cost, and I think the fact that you have some numbers published on that already. What are kind of the biggest cost inputs for you? Is it the electricity? Um, kind of where is the biggest driver on that side? Yeah. So when we look at our technology model, you know, we have this kind of projection of, you know, a thousand tons up to say gigaton scale. And, you know, we can see how our cost curves come down. What you find is the three main cost components are essentially the capex for the air contacting, the capex for the regeneration. Um, and actually the capex for the regeneration is one of the major cost components. So if you can make efficiency gains, both from an energy consumption perspective, but also materials perspective, you bring that down massively. And also you then bring your OPEX down because the majority OPEX component in our technology is electricity. So actually those are the two maximum gains there. Again, again, to this kind of holistic approach on technology development, if you identify where the key problem is actually, rather than focusing on something where you might make small iterative gains, you go for that kind of order of magnitude gain, actually it brings everything down with it. So, um, you know, when we make these projections, um, we try to make conservative projections wherever possible. For instance, you know, when we use carbon engineering's numbers in our in our data, we use their numbers from three years ago rather than what their current published data is now, right? So um, we're currently going through the process of revising our techno-economics um, to see how it works out as we cross over from kind of using peer-reviewed literature to really, you know, really live scaled data. Um, but that's a process we're going through at this moment in time. Yeah, okay. Um, another question we had was just like, I guess you touched on this a little bit, but um, could you just kind of lay out what, what are the main differentiations between your process and other electro swing capture processes? Yeah, so I'd say there's, I'd say there's like three electrochemical processes that are currently being developed for direct air capture. So everyone will have heard of Verdox. This is an electro swing approach where you have a kind of um, heterogeneous catalyst system where heterogeneous catalyst system maybe is not quite the right word but you have essentially a, a solid material which i understand to be a, a plastic electrode of some kind which is what they've been able to develop and you're processing lots of air you're able to electrochemically coordinate the co2 and then when you're done you've charged the material like a battery almost you can reverse the polarity of your cell and then release the co2 again it's very cool like it's really cool actually like the, you know within the DAC field particularly electrochemical DAC we're all like that is pretty cool um and the other you know others are essentially membrane approaches so you have this kind of um carbon dioxide selective membrane and you're using co2 uh, using electricity essentially to allow for the efficient separation of co2 through that membrane relative to what the gas is um the one thing about these is that they all have this need for like specialist materials so actually from Verdox, maybe through being able to create into a plastic has therefore like the ability to solution process or kind of extrude and we can make all these kind of interesting things with it. So it'd be really interesting to see what Verdox do and where they go with it, given they've developed a plastic technology rather than the kind of, you know, um, really potentially really expensive carbon nanotube approach. Um, but if you're going to be using selective membranes, 
actually quite expensive and not necessarily a thing which exists on the open market by any, any stretch of the imagination. Whereas for us, we use, the, we use the solvent to provide the selectivity. And so actually the, that allows us to select for CO2 uh, over every place of the other gas in the atmosphere. And then also our electrochemical separation approach allows us to bake selectivity in there as well. But we're not relying on specialist materials that have been developed in a lab. Again, I can go to a vendor and be like, I need a material of this specification. And they go, fine, you'll be with you in 10 weeks. So it's a very different kind of thing that we come up with. Think carbon engineering, but without the terrible energy cost on the other side. Okay, um, great. Yeah, thanks for answering that. Um, next one, I think it, we've got a couple on um, sort of the type of energy that goes into the process. And um, I guess two questions. One, you know, which type of renewables are you using as kind of what you've mentioned that needs to power the process? But also, um, and I think we get this a lot as a question and it'd be great to hear your answer. But um, when you think about the energy consumption perspective, um, you know, does it make sense to reuse that green, ener green energy in a DAC plan as opposed to sort of displacing fossil fuel solutions. Um, how do you think about that? Yeah. So um, remind me of the first bit again. Oh, just which renewables are you currently using? Oh, so, you know, from a renewables perspective, I think uh, at Project Azure, I'll be looking at uh, mostly solar photovoltaics. I mean, there might be some wind baked into the system there, but from my understanding of solar photovoltaics, it's going to basically depend on where the... Uh, where we look to implement the technology and fundamentally you know the renewables are kind of agnostic it's just about the price because it's such a large complex component and we need to be sensitive on price essentially um but we do use published numbers from the british government as part of you know the base study that we did and so actually you know even using grid electricity we think it's going to be price competitive at some scales and the net negativity is still pretty good um in terms of the second part remind me again Oh, yeah, um, just, you know, because obviously there are still fossil fuels. Oh, yeah, use using that. DAC to displace. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, what I can't give you is like a very specific answer here, because I think there will always be cases where you can make the case for something over something else. Like the context is is context is king here. Um, but all I can say is we only judge projects and, and take them forward because we have done the LCA analysis and we judge that net negative CO2 will be removed. I think there's a larger question about direct air capture looking to electrify whilst we're also trying to electrify the entirety of our industry and is that going to be a distraction and the most efficient way of reducing emissions and you know i completely agree with what toby said at the beginning about you know i don't think anyone in the carbon removal space or anyone in dac is saying let's just do this instead of like you know um removing all the uh, emissions in our entire supply chains and you know decarbonizing our industry let's just let's just offset it i don't think anyone's saying that i think we all recognize the need to do both um but i think it will be a case-by-case -case basis and i think there'll be some cases where yeah it might actually make sense to just shut down a coal plant and replace it with a sort of photovoltaic installation rather than removing the emissions from that coal plant because that just seems silly so you know all i can say is like the, the high level answer is we only do things because the lca says that it moves the needle net negative rather than net positive yeah absolutely uh, we've got a couple of questions on like level of decentralization. So, um, you know, there's obviously, you know, people, including people in open air, just building like little mini DAC machines that we can keep at mm. home. There's obviously like plans for much bigger centralized. Which is also really cool. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. I think so. <laughs> a few of them here it's today. great to see the kind of levels of uh, the scale lengths of like innovation that are going on. People like really fired up about this. Right. Um, it's, it's really hard to see. Yeah. So what do you think about in terms of decentralization, um, you know, for your plants and like generally kind of what makes sense uh, as different people are sort of develop developing this on different scales? Yeah, I think, you know, for us, it's what we're looking to do is kind of sit in that probably like a thousand tons a year of capability initially, because this sits at a kind of nice space where the componentry makes sense from a capex and cost perspective, but you have the need as well because it's, um, we'd love to have this kind of um, this interplay with working with CO2 utilizers where they use thousands of tons of CO2. Um, and fundamentally, um, you know, there's that nice crossover in that kind of scale length with utilizers, but also for sequestration projects. We've got Project Orca, for example, about 4,000 tons of capability. So it sits in that nice kind of demonstration of sequestration, but product market fit for utilization straight away. And from a modularization perspective, like, 
it's still an open question. We don't know whether it makes sense to build one unit that's capable of like 10,000 tons or 50,000 tons or 1,000 tons and simply just modularize. But I think as we begin finishing off our design work for JAR and we get a, a better view of what that looks like, we'll, we'll be able to talk about that in greater detail. Yeah, okay. And then just in terms of, you know, thinking about where does the carbon dioxide go? I know this is a big question, the open air community um, in terms of like concrete mm -hmm. production uh, with, the, with the outcomes of these types of uh, technology. Uh, is that a use case you guys have looked at um, outside of just sort of injecting it underground? Sorry, Mago, my, my line broke up for a sec. Oh yeah, no worries. Um, I just that I think um, in terms of the outputs and sort of where the carbon dioxide goes, I know like concrete is a use yeah. case that open air especially is really interested in. Uh, is that one you've looked at? Yeah, so I mean, you know, this this goes to like a kind of market implementation strategy, and this is about fundamentally, you know, how do you make someone pay for it early on? Because it's all about, I think, um, I think Shashank from early on, like articulated it great, I think, in the kind of Climeworks uh, summit that happened last year. And, and he said fundamentally it's about just deployment, it's about getting systems on the ground, it's about learning quickly, and it's about figuring out how you can make the technology the fittest it can possibly be. And we judge actually the best way to do that is to be selling the CO2 and monetizing it at small scales. And having these relatively small deployments, but figuring out how our process economics and our technologies work together very well, so that when we come to implementing really large projects, we're a lot fitter, we're a lot better at what we do. So, you know, actually, we're thinking we want to be providing the CO2 from pilot projects to people that make synthetic building aggregates. We want to be looking at how we can provide the CO2 to companies that make the CO2 to really cool things. And, you know, we have a variety of discussions about that ongoing at this moment in time. And then fundamentally, you know, I think there's always going to need to eventually move to large scale, large scale storage and sequestration. And these are going to be on, on land sequestration options like Carpix or 4401, or you're going to be integrating potentially with the CCUS network where you have the storage capacity for hundreds of megatons eventually in, in, in just one site. But how you get to that scale is the question we need to answer. And we judge that, you know, utilization is a good stepping stone to get there, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just a, one or two last ones before I hand it back over to Toby. So, you know, we recently saw the advanced market commitment of Frontier and Stripe come out. Um, what do you think about that and more broadly about kind of policies, you know, government policies or um, local policies that can help to facilitate the kind of work you're doing? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, you know, I, even if I wasn't running a DAC company, I'd be like, good work. Because, you know, it, it's something that there needs to be this push, there needs to be this momentum developed, it needs to be something which, you know, forces a coalescence, essentially, of everything, all moving parts that need to make this kind of process, this technology, this industry work. And the question with a kind of voluntary carbon credit market question is a very chicken and egg question. It's like, well, you know, you build the technology, but there's no buyer for it. You've got the buyers for it, but there's no technology for it. And so, you know, one has to kind of move first. And I think Stripe, Shopify, Meta, and Microsoft, and, and, you know, all these companies are, are showing the leadership on the side that needs to be developed a little bit further so that companies can actually go and say, I do have an off, off, off take concept. I do have an off take contract from Frontier, or, you know, there is actually the market potential for this technology. Because eventually, once you get past seed and maybe series A, you're going to be talking to financial players in the investment markets and they're going to see returns. And so, if you don't provide a space for those returns to happen, it, it's a dead conversation. So, actually, I think it's really important. And I think the role of governments in regulating the space properly is going to be, is going to be key. I think it's interesting given that. A lot of people have discussions within the voluntary carbon credit markets that it's kind of like a wild west. Like everyone's like really excited about it, but no one knows exactly what the rules are because there have been no rules established. There are principles for removal, all these kinds of things, but um, the demand for it is just so large that, you know, maybe some details get lost in the wash. And so um, governments coming in and providing structure and support for that's very important. I think things like 45Q in the US um, work that's been done by the British government at this moment in time, which I don't know if I'm actually allowed to talk about, but there is work ongoing there at this moment in time. And, you know, uh, regulatory pushes from the EU about how you constrain down and make an even playing field for um, for a variety of different technologies and products that are segmented by things like permanence and, you know, um, quality essentially within this marketplace. It's really important because the worry is that... Um, if you don't have that, you don't have that segmentation, it becomes a kind of commodity market where we view DAC 
and mineralization as the same as planting a tree, and you have this massive price crash. And that that is something which we can't afford from a climate perspective, but also it doesn't remove any CO2 and actually doesn't generate any value for the economy. So yeah. I'll probably stop there because I know it's six o'clock, so six o'clock on my yeah. side. So. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. And I'm going to hand it back to Toby to just uh, talk about the next couple of weeks. Um, but this has been super interesting. I think not just for me, but clearly from everyone in the chat and Q&A. So thanks so much. And Toby, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Mega. And thank you, audience, for so many great questions. Sorry we didn't get to them all, but um, but they were excellent. And Nick, um, that was really a smart presentation and, and great answers. And we're really grateful um, to you for, for being with us here. A um, couple of quick, uh, sorry, um, programming notes. Okay, good. Um, so next, actually, uh, this is a YouTube series uh, called CDR Horizons that Open Air has launched. Episode three um, dropped on Monday with uh, Dr. Stephanie Arcusa from Arizona State Center for Negative Carbon Emissions. And it's super interesting. Um, we reference a lot of these points today, but framework for the certification of carbon sequestration. Check it out. Um, and that, that's episode three. There are a couple of great episodes prior. Um, we also have a special program next Monday. It's at five o'clock Eastern um, time, um, carbon removal and concrete. And this is an initiative called the Four Corners Coalition that Open Air is helping, um, helping get underway to, to start promoting municipal procurement of carbon removal. And uh, Chris Nidal and um, uh, the administrators from Boulder County and Flagstaff, Arizona are going to be presenting this new RFP opportunity. In addition to the existing, very exciting um, carbon removal uh, RFQ that's currently pending for Boulder County. So definitely plan to check that out. Um, in terms of this is CDR, we have, as uh, was referenced in the chat, a hero of open air, Dr. Greg Nemet, is coming next week to talk about how solar got cheap and the implications of, of that um, movement down the cost curve for, for uh, carbon removal and other low carbon innovation. Um, so definitely sign up for that. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, we also have another great program. Um, the following week, uh, Auntie and Marianne, the co-founders of Pura.Earth, which is uh, a carbon removal only um, standard market and registry, um, European based. Uh, and they're going to talk a little bit about the, the buy side of, um, of, uh, of the carbon removal space. So that's going to be fantastic. And then a bunch of other things coming up. We have Captura. Um, Ion Carbon, Climate Robotics, and a number of other great sessions coming up in uh, June, July, and throughout the summer. So please check them out. Join us. Again, next week we have Dr. Nemet. It's going to be fantastic. Um, we're really grateful to all of you for being with us today. Sorry, sorry we ran a couple minutes late, but um, have a great week and we will see you next week. <laughs>